The Nature Conservancy, live in classrooms around the world to teach how nature works to provide our clean air, water, food, and energy. Learn what you can do to help keep nature healthy and productive. Hello everyone and welcome to the Nature Conservancy's virtual field trip to the deserts and grasslands of Africa. My name is Tyler DeWitt and I'll be your host. We're so happy to have all of you with us. In the next 40 minutes, we'll be traveling via YouTube and Google Hangout, first to Kenya and then to Burkina Faso to learn about the land, the people, and the animals who live there. Thanks to the Nature Conservancy in partnership with PBS Learning Media for making this presentation possible. The Nature Conservancy works all over the world to protect land and wildlife. That's what conservancy means an organization that works to preserve wildlife and wildlife habitats. The Nature Conservancy works on projects all throughout the world. In Australia, they work to preserve more than 20 million acres. In Montana, the Nature Conservancy worked to help the pronghorn antelope. These animals graze in different places in the summer and winter, but the two areas were separated by man-made barriers like fences and highways. So the Nature Conservancy worked to build a forest bridge so that animals could easily move back and forth between their two habitats. And in China, the Nature Conservancy is working to protect the natural home of pandas and golden monkeys. Now it's time to meet our special guests. First, I'd like to introduce Nature Conservancy field scientist Charles Olachina, who lives and works in Kenya. Welcome, Charles. So glad to have you with us. Hey, thank you there, and um, I'm really delighted to join you in this uh, event. It's really hot here in Nairobi. I don't know how it is out there in the U.S., but uh, we take it that uh, it's a sign of how the world works. We're just doing about 74 degrees Fahrenheit here, so it's been pretty hot, but all is well. Ooh, sounds a lot hotter than it's been in many areas of the United States. So let's head back to the States and welcome the sixth graders from Bryan Middle School in Elmhurst, Illinois, right outside of Chicago. Hey guys, thank you so much for joining us. And I bet it's a little bit colder in Illinois than it is in Nairobi. What do you guys say? Hi, I'm Olivia. Um, it's about two, de two degrees here and we have one and a half feet of snow on the ground. So hey Bryan Middle School students, Let's hear how much you know about Africa. How many people live on the continent of Africa? Now, whoever said one billion, you were closest. An astonishing 1.1 billion people live in Africa. That's almost three times as many people as live in the United States. So, now let's take a look at a map of Africa to see where we'll be visiting. There are 54 different countries on the continent. Today we'll be visiting two, Burkina Faso in West Africa and Kenya in East Africa. So Charles, where should we go first? Thanks Tyler, I think we want to start with East Africa and Kenya. And today I'm going to be talking to you about the spectacular grasslands of Africa. Uh, what are grasslands, why they matter and why they are so spectacular to the work we do around the world. But these are significant uh, assets that hold wildlife population, that hold cattle economy and communities that have thrived on these grasslands over millions of years. I I'm sure some of you have heard about the Samburu and the Maasai, the proud nomadic people who live in and inhabit these grasslands for millions of years. And they have lived with cattle and with wildlife and this has been a way of life. In this grassland, the critical factor that drives productivity is plenty of rain, good soil, a bit of dry season that really keeps a cycle of production that feeds the cattle, that feeds the people, that provides milk, provides the essentials of life for both nature and the people that live there in so the grasslands are home to an amazing interlocking community of plants and animals that live there. Some of the world's largest mammals live in the grasslands. So let's take a look at this clip of the animals that call this area their home.
Charles, I bet you've seen all these animals in the wild. Can you tell us about some of the most exciting adventures you've had? Yeah, I must admit that I was born in one of the most beautiful parts of the world, and I've been lucky to really experience it in full splendor. Uh, the grasslands of Africa, as I mentioned before, support a wide array of animals found nowhere in the world. Beautiful, majestic elephants. Uh, you have these kingly lions, and you have very humble tortoises, you know, out there in the plains. Uh, so in, in growing up, we've interacted with this wildlife as part of uh, the ecosystem. And one of the most naughty things I tried up when I was growing up was a saying we used to have. We never knew what it meant, that you can actually milk an elephant. And it was really fun as kids trying to go out there and experiment with things that nobody had done, not knowing that nobody can ever dare milk an elephant because, hey, mother elephant is going to really kick you. So yeah. we, we, we tried to, to waylay an elephant on its way to drinking and see, can we really pull it off? My God, that was a near <laughs> death experience. However, <laughs> I mean, mother elephant was sympathetic to us in our own innocent youth, knowing that these are just kids trying to figure out how life works around. So, I mean... Working with nature and living with nature has really imbued me with a lot of experiences that these animals actually are a beautiful creature. They seem to understand man more than man understands them. So it taught me a lot in my growing up and coming to appreciate nature. So we survived that. And to this date, I have a lot of respect to this wildlife that is in these beautiful grasslands. So you tried to milk an elephant. What, what actually happened? We couldn't even get a foot close to it because, you know, we never knew that the elephant, you know, could be having its breast in front, not in the hind legs like cows. So, you know, we were young kids. And so out of curiosity, trying to go the hind legs, find, hey, how can we do it? And the <laughs> elephant, you know, started trumpeting and kicking around and just telling us, hey, young kids, keep off. Uh, oh, this is not for wow. you. This is for baby elephant. <laughs> What yeah. an amazing experience, Charles. That sounds so cool. You know, I, I, I know it's a dream of mine to go and visit Africa and to be able to see these animals in person. And, and I know that I'm not the only one who feels that way. Um, a lot of people uh, visit Kenya and many other countries specifically because they want to experience nature, right? They want to see animals in the wild, hike through beautiful rainforests, maybe swim through cor coral reefs. And uh, this type of travel is called ecotourism. Eco comes from the word ecology, which means nature or environment, and tourism just means traveling somewhere. So the term ecotourism means traveling somewhere to see nature. Now, I, I know a lot of people from all over the world come to Kenya to experience a safari. So let's watch this clip while Charles tells us a little bit more about how ecotourism is affecting Kenya. Excellent. Actually, that T takes me to the reality of what milking the elephant is all about. Ecotourism is milking the elephant. The elephant is actually money on hooves. It's only money on the feet for the communities. There are no buildings. There are no massive highways. There are no railways there. It is pristine valleys, grasslands. So people come from world over to see how we've been able to conserve and manage nature so that we are coexisting with elephants in the same way as we are living with our livestock. And that produces a system that attracts people. So every year, for instance, in the Kenya uh, coasts, we have so many people uh, coming to snorkel and enjoy the coral reefs and spend time with dolphins and the water. Up in the savannas, we have people coming to watch the biggest migration in the world, the wildebeest migration. It's been happening for thousands of years. It's synchronized. Thousands of wildebeest coming from thousands of kilometers away, crossing over the majestic Mara River, grazing over the pasture, and going back in a very kind of uh, sequential fashion. And this is just awesome. Now, what happens is that these people are paying real dollars uh, to come and see these spectacles. People are paying real dollars to come and adopt wildlife. People are paying real dollars to come and experience the culture that these people have helped secure and sustain this wildlife. So that goes into the local economy. In what way? People are paid salaries in hotels. People get dividends because they are running conservancies. Uh, park, park managers hire local communities. And they get income that buys books, pays school fees, is building hospitals. So wildlife is just our way of life. So it's something that we value, an asset that we want to sustain going into the future. That's amazing to hear because, you know, I know that it can be expensive 
to set aside land in a country for animals to live. I know that it can be hard to preserve natural spaces, but what you're saying is that a country can end up making a tremendous amount of money by keeping these natural spaces safe because other people want to, will want to come visit them and they'll spend a lot of money to uh, have that experience of ecotourism. Absolutely. In fact, the word safari came from East Africa. It was, it was a Swahili word, which means a journey. So if you are to come to Africa on a long journey, you are saying, I'm going on safari. Now I end a safari. So safari used to go, to go to the wilderness out there, camp and enjoy nature, leave it undisturbed, pay dividends that go to help these communities. So it is an investment as it is to work to conserve nature for these communities. It is their way of life. It is the economy. Let's go back to our middle school class. I bet some of the students have some questions for you about Kenya. I'm Jackson, and I was just wondering which part of North America has the most similar land to Kenya's grasslands? Absolutely. I've been to America, and when I go to the prairies, the plains, the big sky country where there is endless grassland, that is what Kenya is all about. It's a massive grassland that supports ranching, that supports wildlife. So that's what I can compare. You know, when you go to Montana, when you go to Colorado, when you go to the prairies of Wyoming out there, that is how the grasslands of Kenya and larger part of Africa will look like in the U.S. Do we have another question? Hi, I'm Zach. How often do you see lions? And do people live close to lions, rhinos, and elephants? We see them quite often. Actually, even close to where I live here in Nairobi, where I work, my residential home is less than one mile from a big national park. The largest national park next to a city anywhere in the world is here, right next to Nairobi. So whenever I'm taking an evening jog just next to the fence of the park, I'll be seeing wildlife. Um, if I'm driving out of the city uh, 20 miles into the dispersal landscape that we call Kitengela, I will see rhinos. I will see zebras out there. If I drive north of the, ca of the capital of Kenya, I'll, I'll be able to see as much elephants in Amboseli, in Lewa. So we, we are a very kind of integrated nature and economy here, where on one side there's a thriving capital, on the other side there's pristine nature. So anytime I'm out there there's a likelihood I will see wildlife that nobody else in the world is seeing outside of Kenya. So it is really a paradise to behold. I have a quick question for you, Charles. What about the people in Kenya? Do they support the conservation efforts that are going on there right now? Absolutely, because I think over time what we've come to see that conservation has not happened because of government. Conservation has not happened because they are put like the military to control wildlife. Conservation has only happened because people have embraced wildlife conservation as a way of life. It's part of, it's their second nature. Uh, the Maasai's, in their own spiritual and cultural way, believe that in the beginning God created everything. He created the wildlife first before people, so that's very sacred. We have things that were created before us, so it is imbued in our folklore. It's imbued in our way of life, and people move along and don't want problems with wildlife because in one way, it is God's given creation, and on the other side, it's an economic value to them. They see tourists come, they see university students come to research, they get employed, so that's really the value that people see to appreciate this wildlife. So people live and coexist with this wildlife pretty well. That's amazing. Charles, there's so much more we could talk about with Kenya, but yeah. what do you say we go ahead and take a trip to Burkina Faso? So Burkina Faso is a country that is about 95% a desert. Uh, it means they receive less than 20 inches of rainfall in a year or two. Uh, it means that a lot of the landforms are covered in sand, so they are not productive. But hey, we have people who are living here, there are populations that were born here, there are growing economies, there are societies that are deriving a, a livelihood. And so it will be interesting to see uh, the contrast between the grasslands that we have in East Africa and Burkina Faso, which is a semi-desert to a desert country uh, up in Northwest Africa. And Charles, I know that a problem in some parts of Burkina Faso is that areas of green, fertile land are turning into desert. I'm not sure many of our viewers know that this is possible, right? It's possible for green forest land to become desert. And this is a process called desertification. 
when it doesn't rain for a long time or it doesn't rain a lot, the soil can dry out, plants die, and the land turns to desert. But desertification can also be caused by human actions, like when people cut down plants and trees for wood or to make room for their animals to graze. And it turns out that plants and their roots are particularly important to keep the land moist and fertile. So the more we lose plants from a dry environment, the more it can turn to desert. So, Charles, I understand this is a problem in Burkina Faso, but I understand that there are also some people and one famous farmer who are trying to turn things around and stop desertification. Can you tell us a little bit about this? In the Sahara Desert, where Yakuba, as a young child when he was born, uh, he used to see trees around. And he, he recalls the days when he could drink from some of the springs and streams uh, which are no longer there just because uh, people have over-cultivated the land, people have degraded all the land by removing the trees that used to absorb uh, all the rain and storage. Uh, so Yakuba, in his wisdom from his childhood, is trying to come back and say, how can he restore Burkina Faso from where he was born back into productive land by using the traditional methods of land reclamation that they used. So Yakuba as you will see, has been the front line of using traditional methods, which you shortly see, how he's been able to transform a desert back into productive land. So there's a really important word that you used just a minute ago, and that word is reclamation. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that means? So reclamation really is the process of reversing the, the degradation that has happened because of man or nature-induced uh, process of desertification. So for instance, uh, in areas where trees were cut, they begin by slowly reintroducing the tree species that provide for ground cover. So once you have ground cover and you get a bit of rain, there's good moisture retention in the soil that allows the plants to grow. You also have processes that include doing appropriate farming techniques that do not include cultivating the entire land, so they call it zero tillage. Just plant the seed where it's needed. It means you're not moving a lot of soil. So slowly by slowly you begin reclaiming that wasteland into productive land. That's what reclamation is about. And you could also use a bit of irrigation techniques to introduce water to infuse into these plants. So in the areas of Burkina Faso that are experiencing desertification, what are the things that are causing the land to turn to desert most quickly? What are, what are some of the worst or concerning things that people are doing? Part of the land where, where Yakuba stays is that population is growing very fast. So you can imagine uh, 10 years ago, Burkina Faso had just about 3 million people and the population has doubled. So we have more people occupying the same space and therefore if they're cultivating, it will mean they're cultivating more land so cultivation is expanding into areas that were not suited for cultivation. They're extracting more firewood, so they're cutting down more tree that you used to provide that cover. And then we have people that are increasing the number of livestock. So overgrazing is a big driver. And you know, traditionally how it used to be, we used to graze seasonally. And I think even in Yakuba's community, they used to know their dry season and wet season grazing. Now that changed and they're grazing all over. So that is just increasing the depletion of the ground cover that is driving uh, this kind of desertification problem in Burkina Faso. So a little earlier, you told us about a farmer named Yakuba who is able to stop the desert and come up with new ways to reclaim some of this land. Let's watch a video clip about what Yakuba accomplished and how he was able to turn back the desert. He worked out that before the rains, he had to be ready to capture every precious drop. He started by digging hundreds of small pits that could catch water during the rainy season. Within these pits, he planted seeds, dung, and organic material like leaf litter, and a magic ingredient, termites. The termites crisscrossed Yakuba's fields through a series of small underground tunnels. They became Yakuba's natural irrigation network. When the rains finally arrived, the water could then sink deep into the land. 
In the very first year, it was clear Yakuba was doing something right. Very quickly, he was feeding his family with the new crops, and in 20 years, he transformed an arid land into 30 acres of forest with over 60 species of trees. Yakuba's forest transformed the microclimate. The increase in trees meant more shade, lower temperatures, more windbreaks, and less erosion. Crucially, the trees raised the water table, making life-giving water more accessible. So Yakuba used termites to help turn desert land back into forest. Let's talk a little bit about how this worked. Have you ever seen what happens when you pour water onto really dry dirt? Often the water just beads up on the surface and it, it rolls right off. But termites can change all of this. They dig tons of little tunnels all through the ground that they live in. These are a lot like the tunnels that ants make. And you've probably seen these if you've ever seen ants living in a jar of dirt or in an ant farm. So now those termite tunnels act like tiny pipes for the water when it rains. Now instead of washing right off the dry dirt, the rainwater soaks down through the termite tunnels and stays in the dirt. Since the ground is more moist, plants and trees can start to grow, and the desert can begin to turn back into forest. Now, Charles, is Yakuba the only person who's used this technique? Are, are there others in Burkina Faso and, and other African countries who are using Yakuba's technique to uh, bring back fertile land from desert? Yeah, it's, it's very interesting that you ask, because these were the traditional ways that were applied across a wide spectrum of African communities to replenish land uh, before it got degraded. So in Burkina Faso, for instance, Yakuba is sort of leading a movement. There are more and more families, more and more individuals adopting to Yakuba's uh, methodology of land reclamation uh, because uh, the, the, the termites provide for free labor, free technology, and they are so adept at applying uh, whatever they get from the straws, converting it into humors and creating the tunnels, as you mentioned. So this kind of simple traditional systems are quite significant in beginning to address the desertification problem that's impacting Africa, and not just only in Burkina Faso. We see it in Africa, we see it out in Kenya, we see it in Uganda and Tanzania, where after harvest, communities you know, lay out straws in the field with the knowledge that those straws will be harvested and broken down by termites, so that, as we say, when the rain beats down, it soaks in slowly and quietly like a sponge, and then it allows for other crops to grow. And I think it's, it's simple, but I think it's very neat kind of relationship between small ants, termites as they were, and people who really want to help bring back nature to what it was before. I think it's fascinating too because it's using one natural thing, termites, to help bring the environment back to a healthy state, right? Instead of having to bring in pipes and lots of machines, it's a way to use nature to help nature. I, I, think, that's, I think that's absolutely fascinating. So let's go back to our sixth graders. Who has some questions for us about Yakuba and desertification? Hi, I'm Skylar. How long did it take Yakuba to transform the land? Yeah, Yakuba has been working on this process for close to 20 years. You can imagine what it takes. So it, 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 it takes somebody from being born to about being 20 to see that the land comes back to its natural state uh, because it takes seasons, it takes investment, it takes care so that everything that is being put on the ground can be, begin taking shape. So between 15 and 20 years, we begin to see the certification uh, being handled. And Yakuba is a good case example of how that happened. Do we have another question? Are people the cause of desertification? Yeah, in, in, in a big way, people are contributing civic significantly to the expanding desertification we are seeing, not only in Africa, but around the world. So, for instance, as I mentioned earlier, uh, people are overgrazing uh, very marginal lands, lands that are not productive. So, when the little grass grows, they bring in all their cows and their sheep, and they eat all those grass and they move to the next level. So they eat everything without replenishing. So we see that's one way that people are contributing. Uh, people are also cutting down lots of forests for firewood. Uh, because, again, in places like Africa, not many people are able to afford, like, cooking gas, you know, 
uh, electricity. So they fall back to nature to provide this energy. So the rate of deforestation is very high. In fact, the statistic we have is that the Sahara Desert is actually growing at about 20 miles per year, and that's wow. scary. So we must do something about it and help people institute measures that will reduce this degradation. And this is what TNC is all about in Africa, is working with people to inform and begin addressing these challenges. So Charles, you told us about one fascinating way that Yakuba is able to stop desertification. Are there other methods as well that people throughout Burkina Faso or other African countries are using that, that are also very effective? Absolutely. And you'll be fascinated that the very cows that are a problem to desertification can be the biggest op opportunity for rehabilitating these desert areas. You know the grazing patterns that were traditionally used by pastoralists, the nomads who move around with the livestock? That was actually a smart way of conserving nature and reducing uh, degradation in those landscapes. Just like the bisons move in the plains. You can imagine if you can find them in one range in America. When they eat all the grass, as we say in science, they will eat out their ecosystem. So what the problem that the certification has had is that cows have eaten out their ecosystem. So what we are trying to do, and traditionally what people are trying to do, is go back to those traditional ways of moving around with their livestock in a sequential fashion. So that you eat here this season, allow it to recover, move to the next session, and allow it to recover so it is cyclical. And that's how it has happened in nature. Nature allowed for the movement of grazers around, and that allowed for regeneration. So I see smart solutions that are traditional, that people can work with and get supported. And if it's adopted at scale, we begin really addressing. Because remember, the poop that is coming out of cow has got manure. And when they trample as they move and it rains, that's able to provide a good base for seeds to sprout. So grass comes back. But when they're overgrazing in one area, it is not possible for that to happen. So yes. That's some of the systems that we're even testing here in Kenya. We call it plant grazing, and TNC is really advancing that with communities. That's amazing that just by going back to the more natural ways that these animals would live, we can come up with healthier ways to raise them and to, uh, to be kinder to the environment. That's, it's fascinating to hear that. Yeah. So, Charles, that's about all the time we have for questions right now. But for all of you watching, Here's a cool thing that you can do to help the 20,000 baby elephants born in Africa this year. The Nature Conservancy is working hard to make them safe. So here's what you do. First, you draw, doodle, or paint a picture of an elephant. You can make a sculpture or even wake one out of cookie dough, whatever. Post a picture of your elephant to Instagram or Twitter using the hashtag Elegram or upload it to the Elegram site. That's nature.org slash elegrams. For every elegram that comes in, more money is raised for elephant protection, up to $150,000. So your drawing can make a big difference. If you're interested in learning more about the Nature Conservancy, check out nature.org. The Yakuba clip you saw earlier is just one of the amazing stories that will be featured in the PBS series, Earth, A New Wild, that's starting this week. So now we have John Sessler from PBS Learning Media to tell us more. John? Hello, everyone, and thank you, Tyler, for the introduction. I'm going to tell you how you can continue your virtual field trip, and I encourage all of you to check out the newest series on PBS called Earth, A New Wild, which airs on Wednesdays at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Check your local PBS listings. The five-part series focuses on homes, plains, forests, oceans, and habitats throughout the world, and viewers get an up-close and personal look at a range of species, from giant pandas, to humpback whales, and African lions, to arctic reindeer. Scientists reveal that cohabitations with animals can work and be mutually beneficial. You can continue your exploration of Earth, the new wild, on pbslearningmedia.org and our newest student site, pbsstudents.org. On both sites, you will find video clips from the Earth, the New Wild series and incredible resources created by the Nature Conservancy. 
You can learn more about Yakuba, the innovative farmer Charles spoke about today, by watching how he developed new techniques to create a large, easy-to-farm forested area in Burkina Faso. Or you can get up close and personal with Sumatran elephants and learn how trainers are working with local animals to safely protect the forest. I encourage all of you to check out pbslearningmedia.org and pbsstudent.org for these videos and lesson plans and resources and 100,000 more free resources at your fingertips. Continue your exploration at pbslearningmedia.org. Thank you, Tyler. Thanks so much, John. That sounds like an amazing show. You don't want to miss it. So this is almost the end of today's field trip. We're so happy that you were able to join us, and we really hope that you enjoyed it. Um, I'd like to give a special thanks to Charles Olachina of the Nature Conservancy for introducing us to Africa today. Thank you so much, Charles. You're really welcome. I really appreciated the opportunity. And Charles, I have one last question for you. What would you say to young people who are really interested in helping to conserve nature in the world all around us? So the future belongs to nature. We all depend on nature. And whatever small gesture you do today, back at home, back at school, uh, back at your playgrounds, it will be important to consider the trees, the water, the birds, and the things that really add value to meaning in life. So I would really encourage you to go out and enjoy nature. It's beautiful, it's wonderful. And because as we say here, our responsibility is to leave nature as beautiful as it is for the next generation. So we are just passing the baton to your generation and you will be responsible to do the same for the generations to come. Nature is here to stay. Thank you so much, Charles, for joining us. We're really lucky to have had you. Um, also, a big thanks to John Sessler of PBS Learning Media, and a big shout out to the sixth grade students from Bryan Middle School for asking such great questions. Bye. To all of you viewers out there, be sure to join us for our next field trip. We're so happy that you could join us. Goodbye. The Nature Conservancy, live in classrooms around the world. Learn what you can do to help keep nature healthy and productive.